Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Wednesday, August 31st, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight. If Mr. Trump is suggesting that there is a conspiracy theory that is uh, being propagated, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. Just weeks after Barack Obama labeled Donald Trump a conspiracy theorist for suggesting that the elections might be rigged, the DHS says they are now considering a special declaration to take charge of the elections. The federal government doesn't run the election process. Then, more damaging revelations about Hillary Clinton from WikiLeaks as new data outlines her unholy alliance with Saudi Arabia and the creation and support of ISIS in Libya. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Of course the elections will not be rigged. What does that mean? Well, as you just heard in the Tonight, uh, Obama said, elections rigged? What could that possibly mean? That's a Donald Trump conspiracy theory. Federal government doesn't run the elections. They're run by the states, not if they have their way. Today, Homeland Security says they're going to take charge of elections. We're going to talk about that. But before we do, I want to talk about what happened in Brazil. Because what it does is it sets up essentially, I think, a harbinger for what may happen this year in our presidential elections. A lot of people believe that the Brazilian elections were rigged back in 2014. There's a lot more going on in Brazil than just a messed up Olympics. Today, they ousted their Brazilian president, uh, Dilma Rousseff, in an impeachment vote. They needed a two-thirds majority to get her out. They got more than the 67% they needed. They got 75% of the senators voted her out. Now, she is a hardcore leftist. And as the hardcore left Washington Post reported this, they say that she was elected to her second term in 2014, but her ratings tumbled amid a severe economic recession, a multi-billion dollar corruption scandal at the state-controlled oil company Petrobras that tarred much of Brazil's political class. Well, the actual fact is that did not happen after the election in 2014. That happened prior to the election of 2014. Many people pointed it out at the time and pointed out that they believe that the election was rigged. Let's go back in time two years ago. And even prior to the November election, this was originally written by Henry Macau, picked up by a number of outlets. He pointed out that she had bankrupted the country. This is before the re-election. She had bankrupted the country. She had brought growth to a standstill. Inflation had come back to six and a half percent and basically pointed out that she was a Marxist from the Workers' Party, and she was booed by 60,000 fans at the last World Cup games. This was before the election. Showed her quite a bit behind in the polls, and yet what happened was electronic voting machines run by a company out of Venezuela, Smartmatic, which was created to keep President Hugo Chavez of Venezuela in office. And he goes on to point out, refer to the very same things that the Washington Post implied happened after the election, implied that was reason for impeachment. No, these were things that had happened before she got elected. A scandal that broke a week ahead of the voting. The financial associate of her party, a front man responsible for sending money to offshore secret accounts for paying bribes in the name of the party, revealed to the police that her party was ransacking Petrobras, the largest Brazilian company, half owned but totally controlled by the government, to the amount of 3% of every purchase. Part of the money would go to funding campaigns, some of it would go to the pocket of party members, the rest to bribe congressmen from other parties to vote for whatever Dilma wanted at the amount of 60,000 US dollars each month. The whole amount came to $10 billion, nearly bankrupted this country. Now, that was what was happening. Doesn't that sound like the Clintons? Massive pay for play? Scandals within the party breaking just as the election is going. And of course, as we now see, control of the election. Look at, and they call this a possible coup. They say, look at the three steps in which this happened and ask yourself if this isn't happening in America today. First of all, an obscure and mediocre lawyer whose only claim to fame was to have been in service for that political party is taken to be the president of the Supreme Voting Court. In other words, what Jay Johnson, head of Homeland Security, just said today, we're going to take charge of the elections, okay? So first of all, you get your guy in as the one who counts the votes. As Stalin said, it doesn't matter who votes, it 
The only person who counts is the one who counts the votes, okay? Number two, use electronic voting machines. Again, Smartmatic, the company chosen in order to take care of the electronic system and the voting machines in the country. Created in Venezuela, created by Chavez cronies so they could rig the election there. Rigging elections throughout Central and South America, rigging elections in the Philippines. In some cases, losing 25% of the votes that have been cast with no ability to audit these votes. They just disappeared, and you take their word for it, how this is voted. You can't, you can't control election if 25% of these uh, the votes are just put out there by the uh, voting company without any auditing trail, okay? Number three, on the evening of the election, most of the country finishes voting about five o'clock, but in a critical key state, a battleground state, they delay the voting. How many times have we seen this in American elections? Finally, the main election poll company that receives millions of dollars in contracts with the government and is known to favor the party in every poll decides not to conduct exit polling. Okay, not conduct exit polling because, and again, in America, we have one company that does all the exit polling for the press pool, one company, and they only report cross-tab demographics. They never use the exit polling to validate the actual results in the election. So here we are today, going down that same path. An amazing parallel between this Marxist female who took over the government in Brazil and our Marxist candidate that we got right now. And they're pushing to have now the federal government be the election monitor. Okay, this is what uh, he says he's gonna do. But let's, let's take a look now at the Clintons. It goes from Brazil to Donna Brazil, the person who has been a long time crony capitalist friend of the Clintons. And she came out and said a couple of days ago, she said, I don't know what the smoke is. Remember, Hillary Clinton took that metaphor, wherever there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah, we all know that's the truth, but she inverted that metaphor. She said, uh, there's a lot of smoke, but there's no fire. <laughs> Common sense tells you that there is a fire. Common sense tells you that there is massive corruption with this woman who structured everything to hide what she was doing. But Donna Brazil wanted to uh, not talk about that. I want to go to a clip that was put out this last weekend. This was, I think, at the end of the week, Fox and Friends. Julian Assange had multiple interviews with Fox News, and they asked him, what was the most damaging email? And here's what he had to say. A major failure by the uh, Trump campaign and the Bernie Sanders campaign, Hillary Clinton tried to run uh, on her having judgment and experience in the State Department. She was the leading architect, uh, the leading political force driving uh, to destroy uh, the Libyan state. Mm -hmm. Generals in the Pentagon, not all of them, but a number, uh, were pushing strongly that the Libyan state should not be destroyed because uh, radical jihadi groups would move in and take it over, which they did. Now, of course, Assange told them that the most damaging information was yet to come. But I thought it was interesting that he didn't focus on the memos that showed pay for play, the patterns that had come out that had been released by uh, Reuters when they had to sue to get this information, to look at her schedule, to correlate that. But he focused on what he called the TikTok menu. And what this does, as he pointed out in that clip, he said, this is something that has been sitting here, not used by Sanders, not used by the Trump campaign. She was working to put herself out there as the driving force behind Libya. And of course, this is before Libya blew up in everybody's faces, before Libya became a set the Middle East on fire in Benghazi with arming ISIS with the Syrian civil war. And this is what the TikTok menu says. This is an article from DC Whispers. They say the TikTok email outlines how Hillary Clinton did the bidding of her Saudi masters and turned Libya into an ISIS hellhole. Well, we all know that it is an ISIS hellhole, and we do know that she does the bidding of her Saudi masters, but they're just part of a larger coalition of donors. It would also include the bankers who wanted to shut down Gaddafi because he was setting up a gold-backed currency to compete with the Western central bankers. But let's take a look at what they actually did with the memo, okay? If you look at this memo, this is from Jake Sullivan, and it goes to Cheryl Mills, close con uh, confidant of Hillary Clinton, and Victoria Nuland, the person who revived the Cold War for us in the Ukraine. And it says, this is basically off the top of my head with a few consultations on my notes, but it shows that the State Department leadership, ownership, stewardship of this country's Libya policy from start to finish. That's the key thing. Hillary Clinton needs to own the Libyan foreign policy. She wanted to. 
five years ago, but she doesn't want to now. She wants to put some different a distance there and say, what difference does it make? They own it from start to finish, she said. Let me know what you think. Victoria, who else might be able to add to this list? And he put Secretary Clinton's leadership on Libya. And the key paragraph right there, HRC has been a critical voice on Libya and administration deliberations at NATO and in contact group meetings, as well as the public face of the U.S. effort in Libya. She was instrumental in securing the authorization, building the coalition, tightening the noose around Gaddafi and his regime. In other words, as she cackled, we came, we saw, he died. She put this together, and they go through a very long list, a chronology of the various things that she did, meeting with her donors, meeting with foreign governments, and as I pointed out, meeting with the French and telling them, look, you want to re keep your neo-colonialist uh, influence that you've got going here in Libya? We can help you do that. We're going to take out Gaddafi because he's going to become a leading person in this area. And of course, these emails that were released showing what was going on, we knew that was happening back in 2011. We reported on it. New American reported on it. Many outlets reported on the fact that we all knew that Gaddafi was making no secret of setting up a gold-backed currency to go into competition with the fiat currencies of the central banks, with the petrodollar that we created, with, again, with the Saudis. And yet we see in their deliberations that was a key factor. We saw that back in January of this year. Actually, it was on New Year's Eve when they liked to release information. The State Department released and declassified 3,000 emails back on New Year's Eve 2015. Just like we saw this information coming out on July 4th. They picked the holidays where nobody is watching to put that in. But of course, it's not a conspiracy any more than the fact that the federal government is going to try to run our elections. Now, what will happen after Hillary Clinton becomes president? Well, you know, the first thing that she wants to do, if it happens, unfortunately, is to take away our guns. And a key part of that, I think, is creating a public opinion perception, and Hollywood is a key part of that. Hollywood is a key part of trying to get Hillary Clinton elected. And we see that one of the key people in Hollywood working with her to get her elected, Harvey Weinstein, has now said that he is going to do a reimagining uh, of course, they say it's going to be factual, a reimagining of the Waco siege and the murders there. A very fitting thing to do, because it was Hillary Clinton herself that gave that order. They gave that order to Janet Reno, who told people, give me a reason that we don't uh, do this. Uh, we know from uh, documents that came out that it was actually between Vince Foster and Webb Hubble, uh, that Vince Foster and Hillary Clinton were pushing very hard to end this siege with Webb Hubble, also with Janet Reno. But we now have Hollywood stepping into the breach, and this is someone, Harvey Weinstein, who has made no secret of the fact that he wants to end the Second Amendment. He hates the fact that anyone other than the government has guns. Uh, they're, they've already picked the people to uh, play David Koresh. As a Hollywood reporter describes it, they say this event series will explore the truth, I bet, uh, behind this tragedy and speak, and this is key, speak directly to the heart of the current issues between citizens law enforcement, and the media. Understand that when they talk about current issues, they're going to use this to push for more gun control. And this is something that he's done in the past. Going back to 2014, January 2014, a U.S. News and World Report said Hollywood takes aim at gun rights. Who is at the center of that? Again, Harvey Weinstein. He said at that time, two years ago, that his next film would be to take down the National Rifle Association. That film, which looks like, according to inter Internet Movie Database, it looks like that's not going to go into production. They say it was going to be called The Senator's Wife, and it would expose the NRA, they said, for their behind-the-scenes machinations, okay? Well, what about the behind-the-scenes uh, plotting of Hillary Clinton? We're not going to expose that, right? Hollywood is uh, not going to do a series on <laughs> Hillary's uh, dark emails. They say, according to the blog that they had at the time, the film would star Oscar winner Meryl Streep and others who are A-listers. It would be a behind-the-scenes account how the NRA used its influence of politicians to defeat the bill. And they point out Weinstein has filmed such films as Django Unchanged, Grindhouse, Kill Bill 1, Kill Bill 2, and Pulp Fiction. They say the man knows his violence. Now, Fast forward to last year, September last year, a new pro-gun control film has gotten the green light and a distribution deal. This film, Miss Sloan, sounds remarkably similar, 
Hollywood doesn't have too many original ideas, do they? They want to get somebody who is going to be fighting the NRA. And now they, this film actually is going to come to production, uh, possibly not before the election. It's titled Miss Sloan. It was purchased at the Toronto Film International Film Festival. It's about an ambitious lobbyist whose career is focused on bringing about stronger gun control legislation, and it will star Jessica, Jessica Chastain, and it is going to happen. They say in 2014, uh, Harvey Weinstein had uh, planned on doing something very similar to that with Meryl Streep, but that looks like that's not going to go through. So who is Harvey Weinstein? He has run multiple fundraisers for Hillary Clinton, of course, and in the most recent one that just happened uh, back in uh, June, they said there was a strict no social media policy at the star-studded fundraiser hosted by Harvey Weinstein. They said the sold-out event uh, for only 50 people was $33,000 ahead. They said no tweeting, no photos, no anything, but people took pictures of the big-name stars as they were going on the outside, okay? And, of course, this is co-hosted by A-listers like Leonardo DiCaprio. It also had Jennifer Lopez, Sarah Jessica Parker, Matthew Broderick, and others at the event. This is what we've seen even more recently in the Northeast, Martha's Vineyard, where she had a $100,000 plate dinner with the Rothschilds, going from hedge fund managers to the Rothschilds to Hollywood and no tweeting allowed. Now, when we come back, Joe Biggs is going to join me. We're going to talk about Trump's visit to Mexico today as well as what Hillary said to veterans trying to get them to leave Donald Trump, who he has a huge uh, margin with veterans over Hillary Clinton. Also, I'll have more information about election fraud and rigging from Owen Schroer and Margaret Howell, and I'll have my interview with Gary Haven. He was an eyewitness to the Haitian relief efforts, and he said the Clinton Foundation was nowhere to be seen. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining me now is Joe Biggs. And Joe, today Donald Trump was in Mexico. Uh, it's going to be interesting to hear what they talked about. What do you make of that? Well, the Mexican president said that it was a good meeting. He also pointed out the fact that he actually invited two people, hmm. both Trump and Hillary Clinton. And Trump is the only one that actually showed up. And Trump is hated there more than Hillary Clinton. So where's Hillary at? Well, you know, she doesn't hold press conferences either. Today is, I think, day number 271 since she yeah. held a press conference. He's had uh, 16 press conferences, which is about two per month. She's afraid to talk to the press to take questions from them. She's afraid to talk to the Mexican president. And she dumped on uh, Donald Trump for going down there and talking to uh, the president of Mexico. At the same time, they want to portray him as an isolationist. Well, she won't talk to anybody except fundraisers, where she gets uh, 30000 to $100,000 a plate. Yeah. She'll talk to those people. Everybody else, forget it. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the most important topics this election cycle is what? Immigration. Yeah. And Donald Trump came out and said, you know, we're going to go out, we're going to round these people up, we're going to deport them back, and they can come back in the right way. And I think one of the easiest steps we can take, I think should be the first step in dealing with this uh, illegal immigration problem, is the fact that we have thousands upon thousands of illegal aliens right now incarcerated in our prison systems that cost us, the American taxpayer, $18.9 million per day mm. to feed, clothe them, and house them in these prisons. Well, back in April, Obama released, I believe it was 19,723 illegal aliens back in who are convicted criminals, mm -hmm. 500 of which were murderers and 900 sex offenders. Yeah, bring it on. So that yeah. is ridiculous. We need to release them, take them because they're already caught, send them back over the border, ban them, remove these invisible handcuffs that Obama's put on our ICE agents, our Border Patrol, yeah. and allow them to do their job and keep those guys from coming back over so we can secure the border and make America safe again. And it's very telling when we see Obama and, as we pointed out, the uh, yogurt billionaire for Chobani, actively promoting refugees coming in this country that they cannot vet. Well, they have uh, prisoners, people who are violent criminals that they have vetted and they bring back into this country as well. We're going to play a report from John Bound where Hillary was talking to some vets today. But before we do, real quickly, there was a news story that came out a couple of days ago, about a week ago, saying that uh, Jim Webb, who ran as a Democrat for president, and he had a very interesting uh, couple of debates where he came out and he called Hillary Clinton out on her hypocrisy on gun control, saying you got a, you got a vast number of people protecting you, you got a lot of nerve doing that. He did that in a Democrat debate. And of course, he's not really been strongly allied with either party. He was uh, Secretary of the Navy under Ronald Reagan, 
but this is a guy who calls it as he sees it. Now, we, this has been reported that he has endorsed Donald Trump. We don't have any verification of that, but we do know that back in March, he said, I will not vote for Clinton, but I may vote for Trump. He said on MSNBC's Morning Joe, he said that, and he said, um, if you're voting for Donald Trump, you may get something very good or very bad. If you're voting for Hillary Clinton, you're going to be getting the same thing. In other words, yeah. bad. And we've heard that same uh, phrase essentially put out by Julian Assange. Yeah, exactly. I like where he's going with it. He, he, he's trying to be smart. He doesn't want to come out because that could screw, his, screw up his career. But he can say that I'm not voting for Hillary, and it's mm -hmm. kind of like a silent endorsement Overall, you know, like you said, his stance on guns, he's pointing out the hypocrisy that these people are guarded day in and day out by people with guns, yet they right. spent every waking moment trying to disarm us. Yeah, it's and I don't know if he has endorsed him or not. We do know that uh, the same thing about Hillary was said by his campaign, senior strategist of his campaign. And then two days before this story came out saying that he was going to uh, vote for Trump, uh, we had a story from the Washington Post, and what they were doing was trying to push veterans into opposing Trump. They said, why? Many veterans are sticking with Donald Trump even after he insulted a Gold Star family. And you know what that's about, Joe. This yeah. is a guy who has been promoting Sharia law that Hillary Clinton came on before she took the nomination. And they brought him on to attack with ad hominem attacks to attack Donald Trump. And, of course, he's fair game dog. if he's going to get into the politics aspect of it. Donald Trump didn't attack him because he was a Gold Star family. He attacked him because he was promoting Sharia law because he was attacking him personally. But in that article, there is a quote from Senator Webb's son, uh, Jim Webb Jr., who said, I think there's a pretty sour taste in a lot of guys' mouths about Iraq. And that's what ha has happened here. He says, you part your time, your effort, your blood into something, you see it pissed away, and you think... How did I spend my 20s? He said there's a mentality they don't want to see more of that. They were worried that a Hillary Clinton presidency would result in continued adventurism given her record of supporting interventions in Iraq and Libya, as I talked about at the beginning of the broadcast. Yeah, hardly anyone showed up to Hillary Clinton's rally today, a veterans yeah. rally. I saw a yeah. picture that was taken from outside the arena, and there was like, you know, like just tons of chairs left wide open. So let's go to that report from John Bowne. With America's distaste for Hillary reaching record levels, making her the most unpopular Democratic nominee in American history, as ABC and Clinton cheerleader The Washington Post reported, among all adults, 56% now view Clinton unfavorably, up 6% points in three weeks, compared with 63% who say the same thing about Trump. Among registered voters, the two candidates have nearly identical unfavorable ratings. 59% for Clinton versus 60% for Trump. And those are the numbers given by the mainstream crack house media that support the Clinton machine. The Washington Post even added that if it weren't for Trump, in fact, Clinton would be the most unpopular major party presidential nominee in modern American history. Why is she so unpopular? It's simple. Most people hate being lied to. And Hillary's entire career is a series of lies in slow motion. Ocean. Just a few of the zingers include statements like these when she said she never received nor sent any material that was marked classified on her private email server while Secretary of State. She said, you are three times more likely to be able to get a mortgage if you're a white applicant than if you're a black or Hispanic, even if you have the same credentials. And the delusional remark that we now have more jobs in solar than we do in oil. But there she was, speaking today to the American Legion in Cincinnati, Ohio, railing on about her hypocritical understanding of the exceptionalism of the United States of America. The United States is an exceptional nation. I believe we are still Lincoln's last best hope of Earth. We're still Reagan's shining city on a hill. We're still Robert Kennedy's great unselfish compassionate country and it's not just that we have the greatest military or that our economy is larger than any on earth it's also the strength of our values the strength of the american people everyone who works harder dreams bigger and never ever stops trying 
to make our country and the world a better place. An exceptionalism she took advantage of as Secretary of State as she fueled her pay-to-play Clinton Foundation empire and the exceptional Americans she took advantage of on that night, September 11, 2012, when four Americans lost their lives and ten were injured in an attack on a diplomatic compound fronting for a CIA weapons storehouse in Benghazi after a stand down was ordered that Hillary oversaw. And you see Congress scared to go the next step of saying, hey, you did this on purpose and you were caught lying, you witch. Who should have been held accountable was Hillary Clinton for having gone into Libya. But Gowdy never discussed this issue, never went into the real problem of how she created a chaotic state and a terrorist state. The building itself was not a State Department building. It was a secure consulate which basically goes under the CIA. She painted Trump as an isolationist who threatens to walk away from our allies. Allies like LGBT-hating Saudi Arabia that have beheaded 101 people this year on par to beat last year's record of 158. She spoke about immigration, regardless of the fact that just days ago her husband was declaring that the Syrian refugees should be relocated to Detroit to rebuild it. Rebuild it into what? Bill, an American no-go zone of Sharia law? Hasn't Detroit suffered enough under you and your NAFTA cohorts? She claimed that Russia hacked into the DNC. You've seen reports. Russia's hacked into a lot of things. China's hacked into a lot of things. Russia even hacked into the Democratic National Committee. Maybe even some state election systems. Of course, this has yet to be proven, and for the most part has been disproven. I am deeply honored to have so many retired military leaders backing me, along with these Republican experts. Hillary is unpopular because she is simply difficult to even listen to if you have half a brain. Meanwhile, where was Donald Trump? Right where a modern presidential candidate should be, getting it done. John Bound for Infowars.com. I'm talking to Gary Haven, and I want to talk to him about the things that he witnessed in Haiti related to the Clinton Foundation. Of course, Gary, we're getting all of these emails that are being released uh, by people showing the internal workings, the corruption, the pay for play that's happening with mm -hmm. the Clinton Foundation. But you have some eyewitness uh, things that you saw in Haiti with the Clinton Foundation. Tell us about what you saw there. You know, David, uh, uh, 10 days after the earthquake in Haiti, uh, I was over there with my aircraft, and uh, the goal was to bring in a doctors to help these people and to take orphans back to the hospitals in, in Miami. And I'd been, I've been over there so many times I can't even count anymore. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I've been feeding 10,000 children a day in Haiti. We wow. ship over beans and corn and rice. And uh, uh, so I've had a firsthand account. Uh, a couple other interesting things I've done. I flew George Bush over. Uh, in my aircraft, met with the current president of Haiti uh, and, and, and got to see an inside from the presidential palace of, of, of who was doing what in, in the environment. And by the way, I took Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul, who's a, an eye surgeon, over last November, and uh, he and two other surgeons uh, uh, were able to remove cataracts from the, the from the 200 elderly, desperately poor Haitians. Mm. One day they were blind and had been many for 20 years and the next day they could see. So uh, Amazing. I know what it is to get things done over there. Uh, uh, but, but I tell you what, I've, I've watched the Clinton Foundation raise hundreds of millions of dollars specifically for Haiti. And I'm gonna tell you, I've never seen any evidence uh, uh, that they've spent money on the Haitians. Uh, Senator Paul told me that uh, 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 people who had studied this had found that 96% of the money that was given to the Clinton Foundation for Haiti relief. 96% was spent on the Clintons, on family member salary, on exotic travel. Uh, you, you know, for someone who, who takes their money and, and gives it to, to, to help the, 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 the poor, the widows, the children, the starving, to see the blatant theft that the Clintons have, have done with the Haiti Initiative uh, is just incredible. You know, David, you've been reporting on uh, the Clinton Foundation, and uh, uh, I want to aim in a couple things that, that, that you've talked about. You know, they, they first founded the foundation not in the U.S., but in Canada. 
And the reason they did that is the Canadian version of, of foundations does not require the disclosure of who makes the donations. <laughs> and, and so why did the Clintons create their foundation in Canada? Well, uh, they wanted to provide cover uh, for, for the people that, had, were, that were giving them money, that were paying to play, of course. And then, by the way, when they transfer the money from the Canadian version of the foundation to the U.S. version, uh, uh, it's, it's basically laundered money. And mm -hmm. uh, this is the most blatant uh, RICO uh, crime scheme. scheme. And, and we're now talking uh, probably about a billion dollars. And it's done right in our faces. Uh, uh, why doesn't the IRS go after these people? Why doesn't the feds go after them? Because it is so obvious and in our face. You know, we simply live in a lawless society now. And as a free American, I'm tired of it. You know, I'm demanding justice, not just for the starving Haitians who have been deprived of food because of people like Hillary Clinton, but the American people uh, that have been duped into thinking these are good people when this is one of the biggest con games in the history of the world. Imagine laundering a billion dollars of money from heads of government, from dictatorship, uh, to trade favors as the Secretary of State. This isn't hard to understand. And I know a, a lot of the American people have drank the Kool-Aid and, you know, they're, they're not used to thinking criti critically, but this is so in your face, crime and theft, it, it's such a magnitude. Uh, I, I don't think we should dare uh, let the, the criminal Clinton family, and by the way, Hillary is a, is a one woman crime wave. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and we have the evidence to, to arrest her and charge her with innumerable crimes. But of course, no prosecutor in their right mind would do that, according to the FBI director. He could come in and talk about all the felonies that she's committed, and then at the same time say, but no prosecutor would do this. Oh, but don't you try this at home, because we just had a case where a guy got uh, a year in jail for six and they were classified confidential photos that he took in a submarine where he was working, okay? He admitted it, unlike her, who's still denying it. And for those six confidential things, and yet she's revealing stuff that is above top secret. There are people in the NSA that uh, Judge Napolitano, as well as William Benny, have said they believe that she is a danger to their lives. We had Rudy Giuliani this weekend saying that uh, what they're involved in, exactly what you said, is racketeering influence as a corrupt organization that is the essence of the clinton foundation the money laundering that's going on there we've seen that as well now revealed in these emails we've been drawing all these dots to everybody and i think gary it's it's kind of like a fatigue that the uh, public has it's like they think they've heard it all before because there's been so many of these corruption scandals it's, a, it's hard to get their attention you know where the fault lies david in in the in the solution uh you're supposed to have a two-party system, or at least a multiple-party system in this country. And, and there's another party called the Republicans. And, and the Republicans now have been compromised. They've been bribed. They've been bought and paid for. The establishment Republicans are more dangerous to our country than the Democrats. We know the Democrats are corrupt and communist, and uh, uh, that, that's hopeless. But the establishment Republicans that walk among us and act as if uh, they're, they're constitutionalists, they're the ones that need to rise up, and, and, and when the prosecution, uh, uh, prosecutors want to make, bring charges, uh, or, or, or when the Justice Department uh, uh, sits on their hands and, and, and makes excuses, mm -hmm. uh, as, as Comey did, the, the Republican Party, our congressmen, our senators should stand up and they should initiate charges of treason and all variety of crimes and do their damn job uh, instead of, uh, uh, of letting these criminals have a pass. I blame the establishment Republicans and their, and their compromised, bought and paid for uh, attitude over this thing. And people like me can demand from their Republican representatives, go to Washington, do your job. We don't care if you're uncomfortable. We don't care if people ridicule you. Bring back the rule of law to this country and prosecute these people and charge them with treason if need be. And I tell you what, uh, the American people are waking up and they know that the Republican Party is bought and paid for. And if you want to keep your jobs, then you better start doing your jobs. 
Because what we've got right now is we've got a single party. It's been revealed. I think that's one of the key things to come out of the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. We understand that there is a single party, a globalist party, that involves the people at the top of both the Republicans and the Democrats. They all work for the same people. They have the same agenda, even though the Republicans will lie to us about it. The, re the Democrats, at least, will say what they're going for, okay? But for the most part, the Republicans will lie to us about it. Why? Because they work for the same people and because they want those lovers of power. They're not going to come after Obama when he uh, unconstitutionally uh, puts out executive orders. They will allow that to set there because they want that power when they get the uh, when they get in, in his place. You know, it's not just that. So uh, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's kind of a reasonable position to take. I think it's more, more heinous than that. Uh, they're letting Obama get away with outright treason. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm so yep. proud of Trump to 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 start talking about ISIS being a creation of of uh, Obama and in 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 Hillary. You know, I've been talking about that for over a year now. Uh, you know, when when ISIS went into Mosul and and took over 2,500 armored Humvees, it had the keys in the ignition. By the way, you know, and a billion dollars worth of military equipment, and we didn't send in a couple of F-18s to destroy it. We mm -hmm. literally equipped the ISIS army, and that was a deliberate act. Yes. And the media, of course, doesn't want to talk about that. I knew then that ISIS was a creation and, and a proxy army uh, that the elitists were using to accomplish their goals. But I don't think the Republicans are doing it because they want the power. You, you see, there's a global movement. And and the, now we're talking about it. it. It's all of us. Trump is talking. About it. See, mm -hmm. Trump is the nationalist candidate. That's right. Brexit was about nationalism versus globalism. Marine Le Pen in France. We now are openly talking about globalism versus nationalism. And see, globalists know that uh, uh, ultimately to acquire absolute power, and by the way, uh, absolute power corrupts. It corrupts absolutely, but most people don't know the third line of that. The third line of that quote is most powerful men are bad men. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's the, the most important part of the line. Yeah. Yeah. These are bad men that uh, are, are furthering the move towards globalism because they do want absolute power. Well, in the wake of the coverage of this week where election systems have been hacked successfully in Arizona and Illinois, this is according to our news cycle, of course. They're blaming it on the Russians. We have yet to see any proof that they've actually been hacked. Our president, he has a solution. Let's federalize the election system. Despite that power grab not being legal, uh, threatening to illegally nationalize America's election systems under the guise of calling it critical infrastructure. I'm joined in studio by Owen Schroyer. We're going to be discussing this illegal federal power grab. Owen, what do you make of this? So federal power grab, or is he just helping out? I mean, looks kind of shady to me. Well, there's so many different angles that we can take here. And I think that more than anything, actually, what we're realizing here as I've got a story from 2012, and there were stories as, soon, as early as 2002, that there's already been UN-tied groups monitoring the U.S. election. Even ABC News um, had reported years ago in 2012 that a UN affiliate will monitor the U.S. elections. That affiliate was the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, a UN affiliate that has been monitoring U.S. elections since 2012. Mm -hmm. So I think really what we're seeing here is now people are realizing that there are people monitoring these elections from outside, whether it be because they want to see the results that they see fit happen or they want to monitor for hackers. This is already happening, but it is amazing how as you mentioned, they're already demonizing Russia. We've right. already seen the FBI, Harry Reid, they're already blaming Russia for this, as you said, <laughs> without any evidence. Precisely. So you mentioned that monitoring mission. It sparked a national uproar in 2012. I remember that time. President Obama was playing basketball the night before. Uh, he declared victory in that national election. He knew already those monitors. There was something fishy about that. And in this specific case, this is making that look like small potatoes. So we're talking about a swarm of hundreds of United Nations-linked international elections 
election monitors, many of them coming from nations with repressive dictatorships, are going to descend on the U.S. this year to supervise and monitor America's elections. They're going to do this state by state. And uh, he's circumventing. Originally, it was, it, you know, we were thinking it would be more covert than this with a Diebold system. They were going to try to rig it. Trump has been talking about crooked Hillary for months, suggesting that she was going to rig the election just like she stole the nomination away from Bernie Sanders. And it looks like, uh, you know, that that quote far fetched proposal of her rigging, it, it, they're taking it a step further. Well, states can't be trusted with their legal obligation to look at their own elections. We need the president to jump in and do it for us. And Owen, we know from the hacked emails from the Democratic Party leadership, it revealed a plot to rig the primaries in Clinton's favor. They were able to successfully do it. And that's exactly what they're trying to do here. You know, the president, you know, the election laws and regulations, they're the responsibility of the state. He doesn't care about our own legal system. It's not the responsibility of a swarm of U.N. officials, many of them coming from repressive regimes like Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia, Albania. R Russia is no longer a repressive regime, excuse me, uh, and the Ukraine to monitor our U.S. election system. It's insanity. It's insanity. Well, and it's funny, too, they throw Russia in there, you know, yeah. while they're saying Russia might rig it. So, so as you just illustrated, there's going to be an international overseeing of this election from countries where I'm not even sure if they have free elections in some mm -hmm. of these oppressive countries. So why are they coming in and monitoring our elections? I'll never understand. But there's so much irony here. Remember, Barack Obama said that don't be worried about elections. The federal government doesn't. They're not in charge of the elections. That's done on local and state levels. But now, as we're seeing, the federal government is trying to get involved in the election process. So Obama, that speech, he has had to eat his words on that speech so many times. He says he doesn't know what a rigged election is. That's blown up in his face. He also said that the federal government, you know, they don't they don't monitor. They're not in charge of the elections. Now they're pushing for that power. So so what is Obama's problem here? And, you know, it's it's all it's all funny. Another irony of this where. We have the DNC emails. We caught the Democratic Party red-handed mm -hmm. rigging elections, folks. But all you're hearing Obama talking about, all you're hearing the FBI and DHS talk about, is investigating potential hacks into the November elections. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about the fact we caught them red-handed. Don't investigate the DNC. Don't investigate the DNC primaries. Bernie Sanders, don't try to fight the rigging that happened in the DNC primaries. It's, let's just worry about the November election. We're okay that Hillary rigged it, but let's make sure no one's rigging it in November. And if it wasn't for Trump bringing this up, my guess is they wouldn't even be talking about this. They would be burying this in the sand like they had for the last decade. You're absolutely right. And speaking of that DNC email hack, the leaking that's come out of this, and you and I have talked about this at InfoWars, the death of Seth Rich and Assange's words and how he's presumed to be the leaker. Well, you know what? Talk about not investigating things that matter for a second here. So we have these, this email chain where we know that there's mass corruption on a large scale concerning the DNC. And not only is his death not investigated, but the D.C. police chief is then promoted to head of security over the NFL. So not only this is what happens, Owen. So if you if you do your job, shut your mouth, go along with this, you're rewarded. And we've seen this time and again. And here they are. It's in black and white covered on on major news sites, including ours at Infowars.com, that he is going to try to federalize our election system. He's going to do it before he leaves office. And he's going to put swarms of election monitors in our states, just like he wanted to federalize the police system, which we know is a, is a Soros-backed ideology. It's all about this global police system and federalizing it, having UN troops guard us because we're not capable of guarding ourselves. You know, our local police, they can't be trusted. We need to federalize. That's what this is about. That's the same push here. That's what's going on. Well, and, and look, we've got the same people here. Soros wants to federalize the police. Mm -hmm. uh, leaked documents from his open society uh, have proven that. And they say, and this is another irony, they say that they want to take advantage. This is in the documents. They want to take advantage of the crisis of the moment and drive long term institutional change in police community practice. But then when Donald Trump puts out a tweet uh, talking about someone shot in Chicago, he's he's called ex exploitive. Oh, how could Donald Trump do that? But this is, these are the very people who say in their documents they want to take advantage of police shootings. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's the overall picture here that I always have to scratch my head at is 
Why do we go to the federal government for the answer? We recognize the issues in this country. People protest the issues in this country. Why do we go to the people we're protesting for more answers? Why are we expanding these people's power and these people's control in our lives? They already run our lives. We don't want them running our elections. We don't want them running our police. We don't want them running our school systems. It's time to fight the establishment and not just have them open their arms and bring us in in the name of safety or security. This is a problem reaction solution scenario where George Soros funds Black Lives Matter, he causes the clash with the police, and then on the back end of it, he says, well, this is why we need to federalize the police. This is why we need to go more power. And let me ask you this, people of America and Margaret, wouldn't you, and this comes to the elections, this comes to the cops, wouldn't you rather know the person who's running your police department who's running these elections. Wouldn't no, you rather have a face them. and a name? We can't trust them, Owen. No, the, those guys, they're out. All, all we can trust are these UN overseers, these federalized international police policing us because our own, they're too brutal. We, they can't be trusted. You talked about Black Lives Matter. What a terrorism group, a terrorist, a, a domestic terrorist group. That's what we're talking about here. And, uh, you know, all lives do matter, but we, we see where that's considered hate speech. If you write that on Twitter, you are considered prop propagating hate speech. You could be banned or censored from tweeting that. And that's how far we've come. Soros, he, he wants to normalize violence. We were reading a memo where, you know, having uh, the refugee crisis, having refugees commit acts of violence against people in their own in their own country. We, we can't question that or you're a racist bigot hater. He wants to normalize that violence because it's all in a bid to, to federalize and ultimately globalize everything. Absolutely everything. Yeah, and, and that's what you don't want. You don't want a faceless, nameless acronym organization running things where you're not going to be able to get answers. You're not going to be able to talk to anyone on the local level. We need paper ballots. I need to write down my ballot and have that count. I need people I know counting this, people that I can trust. That's how we make sure that rigged elections don't happen. That's how we make sure that our police are working with people in the community to try to make relations stronger. Not going to a larger centralized government. That has been the issue since day one, and I don't want us to crawl into the arms of the Pied Piper here um, and, and let them take advantage of us like they have been for years. Well, you know what? It's all about uh, voter suppression, not having that by conservatives. But hey, if you ask for an ID at a polling station, you're a racist. You're, you're trying to exclude people. You know, basic rule of law, it's being overrun. And now it looks like we're going to have these election monitors from the UN guarding our own election. Well, that's it for tonight. Join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the InfoWars Nightly News.